for being with us, God. And this morning, this service, we commit everything to you, Lord. We turn our attention to you, Lord, the God of the universe, the one who is mighty to save, the one who is mighty to shoulder our, shoulder our burdens. We prepare our hearts for a time of worship. Lord, let everything that we sing, let everything that we say, Lord, be pleasing, be a sweet sacrifice unto you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.
So 
know, as we're singing this song, I'm just keep hearing over and over. If you, then I. So God, if you did this, <laughs> so will I. And you know, everything that we sing about and everything that we praise and we lift up, it really is giving all honor and glory to the greatness that is God in everything, in every pain, in every failure, in every victory, in every defeat, it all screams God's name. You know, in Psalms 147, it says in verse 2, that the Lord builds up Jerusalem, that he gathers the outcast of Israel, that he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Check this out in verse 4. He counts the number of the stars and he gives names to all of them. I don't know if you realize that every Sunday morning that we come together and declare God's glory and his name, that we are declaring the greatness that is in the person of Jesus Christ. And you know, I know that settings, circumstances with, with air, it's probably not perfect in any stretch of the imagination. But the Lord really just kind of spoke doing our serve team together. And, you know, Brandy, you opened with Psalms 34, 1, I'll bless the Lord at all times. And I was reminded that it's not perfect circumstances I need, but it's the perfect presence of a holy God that changes everything. And I wonder if we could just take a moment to declare how great our God is. Because when we recognize that he's the name above all other names, then we're rightfully putting things in order. So what it does is it takes maybe what makes us uncomfortable and it sets it right underneath the glory of God. It takes maybe what's not so perfect in our life and it puts it right underneath the glory of God. Because the last I read my Bible, it says to seek first what? His kingdom and his righteousness and all of these other things would be added unto you. And so I wonder if we could just have a moment together to just declare how great our God is, that he is the name above all names, and that we could declare his goodness even in the midst of imperfect circumstances because we serve a perfect and a holy God. Would you sing together this morning? today we recognize your greatness. Father, that you are great and greatly to be praised. So God, I pray that your presence rest here in this place this morning. God, that we could dine with you and you with us, God. It says in your word, Revelation 3.20, you stand at the door and you knock, and if anyone would answer and let you in, that you would come in and that you would dine with us. And so Father, you're invited. Your presence is welcome here. God, we need you now more than ever. I pray that we leave never the same, always changed glory to glory by the goodness of your name. We love you. We thank you. And it's in your son's name. The church says, amen and amen. Can you give it up for him? Just one good time. It's good stuff. Hey, I think we're, we're probably going to keep the lights a little bit lower to try to facilitate maybe a, like just a cooler venue. Um, guys, on your way down, we're preparing to continue our, our offering as a 
point of our worship as it continues with tithes and offerings. So shake a hand on the way down. Tell people not to breathe so hard around you. Keep it to a minimal. <laughs> as you guys are settling in and ushers are preparing to take the tithes and the offerings, uh, just to let you know, man, serve day is right around the corner. It's this Saturday, June 9th. If you are wanting to be a part of Serve Day, we'll need you to go on to uh, churchofthecrossing.tv. Put your name and a cell phone number or some way that we can keep you in the loop of what's happening. Um, and we'll uh, be sure to let you know the projects that we have on Saturday. So ushers, would you go ahead and come forward? The good thing for you guys, I know it's hot, but uh, remember, I'm a preacher that can preach fast. I used to want to be a rapper. I may even preach faster today. <laughs> So uh, just to get it going, let's pray over the offering. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again that you so graciously gave. For God so loved the world God, that you gave. And so I pray that we give in the same manner, God, with a heart that's just open to you. And so I pray that as we give, it goes to the furthering of your kingdom. Bless the gift. Bless the giver. It's in your name. Amen and amen. Check out the video announcements for what's happening at the crossing. Church at the Crossing, we're so excited you joined us today. If this is your first time with us, welcome. We're glad you're here. For us, church is so much more than a Sunday service. It's a community, and we want you to know there's a place for you here at the Crossing. Stop at our Connect Center outside after service. We have a gift for you as our way of saying thank you for being here. Join us for Wednesday night Bible study every Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. You will have the chance to dive deeper into God's Word while connecting with believers of all ages. Get ready to serve. Serve day is June 9th. We will be participating in serve projects throughout the city from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Sign up at our website under the events tab. We believe in working from rest and not working to rest. Pastor John and Brandy will be on vacation from June 10th through the 16th. We're so excited to have Pastor Mark Benson as our guest speaker. You won't want to miss this message. It's officially summer at the crossing. We want to encourage you to build relationships outside of church service this summer. We invite you to Waterworld on June 24th from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. Bring a friend or two, it's free. Stop by the Connect Tent outside after service to get your ticket. We love staying connected with you. Connect with us by filling out the Connect card in your worship guide and dropping it in the offering bucket. Do you want to learn more about Church at the Crossing? Join us at Waterworld for Connect Night on June 24th. Connect with us online by visiting churchatthecrossing.tv. Stay connected with us throughout the week by following us on Instagram and Facebook. Stay updated with what's happening at The Crossing by tuning in to Pastor John and Brandy's weekly Facebook Live every Thursday at 8 p.m. This is their way of keeping us updated about what's happening at The Crossing. Follow along today's sermon notes on the YouVersion Bible app. Church at The Crossing, we exist to participate in moments of grace. Awesome stuff. Well, we're so thankful for uh, you guys bearing with us. Just so you do know to kind of like, man, are they doing anything about the air? Yes, we are. Um, so that storm either knocked out a transformer, did something. It blew a, the compressor on our unit, the motor on our unit. And so we've ordered the parts. But uh, when your original unit was installed in 1963, um, you got to search for these parts. And we found them in Columbus, Georgia. So it's a five-day job. Unfortunately, today's like day four. So we're one day short. Five is the number of grace. So tomorrow, grace shows up in the form of air. So we're excited about that. We are working on it, um, just so you know. And I, I am, I'm, I'm not going to be distracted. Uh, now you guys can kind of know what it feels like up here because there's never been airflow up here. So just, just bear with me. Um, high school and middle school, real quick, there's summer camp coming up July 9th through the 12th. Uh, there's a meeting right after service in Kids Crossing. And so uh, if you are interested in that, head out to Kids Crossing with uh, Carl. Carl, would you kind of wave up here? He's going to be leading that meeting up. Here's the good news. In that meeting, there is air. So maybe you just don't even want to go to camp, but you want some air. Go to the meeting after church. That'll be awesome. And so uh, as I said, serve day's coming up. Excited about that. My wife and I are actually going to get to go on vacation after serve day. We're going to leave and head out for a week. And so we are excited that we have relationships with other pastors in our area. We think that it's complimentary when the kingdom of God advances together. And it's not about one single house, but all of us together. And so Pastor Mark and Michelle Benson, who we are great friends with, they're over at Dothan First Assembly. He's preaching here next week. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be incredible. So he's got a standalone message. 
message, and then I'll come back on Father's Day and finish out the Worship We Hear You series. And so, I don't know about you, man, this series has been good for me. It's been great. It's been a reminder of some things that I need to align and put back into order when it comes to worship. Because how many people know that worship isn't just part of a Sunday morning service? It's not just the thing you do before the guy comes up and preaches the Word of God. Worship, in fact, is, a, is this place of an encounter. It's a lifestyle where we offer offer back to God just what he's given to us. And so when we praise and we give him back that breath, that ruha, we're literally giving him the breath back that he's put in us. And so we love worship and our series, we're in week three. We had the break last week with Warriors Rest and Jonathan Duncan. And so uh, if you weren't able to catch that, go look at our live stream. I mean, it's an extremely awesome ministry partner that we have that's uh, doing a lot of good work for the veterans. And so they're just right up the road. We're excited about that. And so I hope that you've enjoyed this. Uh, This morning, I just want to jump into the message. I've entitled this message, A Personal Meeting. And so a personal meeting. Worship, we hear you. A personal meeting. And let's look back at our main text uh, for the first time. It's Exodus 3. It's actually a verse that I read last week, and I want to unpack it a little bit more this week. So Exodus 3, picking up in verse 1, it says, Meanwhile, Moses was shepherding the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And when the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire with a bush, as Moses looked, he saw that the bush was on fire but was not consumed. So Moses thought, I must go over and look at this remarkable sight. Why isn't the bush burning up? And when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called out to him from the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, he answered. Do not come closer, he said. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that as we unpack your word, that it is in fact your word unpacked. We know that your word doesn't return void. So, Father, we want to hear from you this morning, and I pray that uh, you just speak to us. All the notes that I've uh, prepared, I submit over to you so that, Holy Spirit, you can have your way. And uh, help me not to be so long of breath this morning so we can get up out of here and participate in moments of grace. Amen. Here we go. So my heart behind this series really is to draw attention to how important worship is. And if you get nothing else out of this series, I I hope you would see that we've taken intentional time to emphasize the importance of worship, not just in our Sunday morning gatherings, but in our normal everyday life at home, when we wake up, when we're driving to work, when we are parenting, when we are talking and discussing things with our spouse. And so it's super, super important. And so growing up, frequently uh, being in worship services, I found it interesting Here's the deal, that so many people can be in the same place, in the same presence of God, but yet some people seem to have more of an encounter with God than others. And I don't know if you've been in settings like that, but it kind of would be like conversations with friends after church with like, man... Kali, you know, when we were singing uh, How Great Is Our God, like the presence of God, did you feel it? It was amazing. I was consumed by it. Man, today's worship was incredible. And then their response is more like, eh, you know, it was okay. It, It hit a flat note or this or that or the other. And so I just found it really interesting that we can be in the same place, in the same presence, experiencing things differently. And so how is that? How does that happen? And so before we unpack our text, you know, in transition this morning, I mentioned Revelations 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone would answer, then I would come in and I would dine with him and him with me. It's in the Bible. And we use that verse as a way to tell people to accept Jesus into your heart. And it sounds good in theory, but in reality, that verse is actually a letter to the church. And so Jesus is speaking to the church. He's speaking to the believer and he's saying, hey, I'm at the door knocking. And if you would let me in, then I would come in. And so this is instructions to the church. Well, why am I telling you this? Because I kind of get this picture of a Sunday morning service where we treat it as if we're eating a, a, a meal starting with the appetizer or worship. And so the appetizer happens. It gets us ready for the meal. That's the word of God. And so maybe we just kind of skate through worship because we really don't want the appetizer. We just want the main course. Can I tell you that if that's your view of a Sunday morning service, you are missing the fact that the meal is served from the word go. 
That you don't have to wait for it to be here. It starts when we open up the service and invite the presence of God to come in and to dine with us. And so what that would tell me is that it's not just about having a good meal, but it's about whom you're dining with. And so if we would have an understanding that the presence of God is ushered into a place, the manifestation presence of God, because we know He's omnipresent, His presence is everywhere, so how do some people seem to get more out of it? Can I tell you? Because it's a personal meeting. That God in all of his magnificent glory can be so intimately involved in your own life that in a large gathering it can still be personal. And are you thankful for that? Because there are things that I'm going through that only God in the intimate knowledge of what I'm dealing with can deal with me in a corporate setting because he still sees me as the one amongst the 99 and he'll say, I've got your attention, you've got my attention and he'll talk to me intimately because it's a personal meeting. And so it's so much more than just going through the motions of a Sunday morning. It's so, so important. And so now that that's out there, I just want to get back to our text with Moses in the presence of God. And so if you're taking notes, here's the first note. Worship goes beyond singing. Worship goes beyond singing. In fact, it is a personal meeting with God. And some of us that can't sing, are you thankful it goes beyond singing? (laughs) Like, yo, I'm just making a joyful noise. I don't even know what keys are other than to start my car. And so Moses, in this personal meeting with God, because that's what happened in Exodus, as we just read in Exodus 3, 1 through 5, is there's a personal meeting that takes place, a conversation takes place. And here's the interesting thing about the conversation that we get in Exodus 3, is it in fact goes on for the next two chapters. And so it's not just like five verses that God's speaking and then he stops talking to Moses. It was just at that place that the evidence of God and the holiness of who he was consumed a place that he was meeting with Moses. And so worship goes beyond singing. It's a personal meeting with God. And this morning, just out of those five verses we read, I want to give you three things that I've observed in studying that text to maybe solidify and strengthen the personal meeting that we can have in a worship setting to encounter a God who is holy and magnificent and glory and, and filled with glory and he's, he's, he's worthy of receiving all the praise. And so I just want to give you three things to take away this morning from our text. And I believe this will help shape our perspective of worship towards an understanding that it is in fact a personal meeting with God. And how many people are thankful it is personal? I mean, really, like, like worship is so personal. I think that's what David understood, too, was how personal that encounter was with God, that he could pin these psalms out of sorrow and out of victory and out of defeat because it was such a personal encounter. And so here's the three things that I want to point out. So the Bible tells us that God inhabits the praises of his people, that he lives and he dwells there. So when we're worshiping, we are positioning ourselves in a personal meeting with God. And so keep that mind of personal, uh, keep your mindset on personal. So the first thing that I see in this text that we just read is the word love. Look. Everyone say look. 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 How many people know that when you're trying to get your kids' attention because you're going to drive home a point, you know, even if they're in trouble, what do you say? Hey, hey, look at me, son. You want to make sure that you have their attention, right? Because what you're about to say is of extreme importance or you don't want them to miss it. And so this concept of look when it comes to worship is something that I see in Exodus. And here's what it says in Exodus 3, 2 through 4. It says, then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire within a bush. We just read that. And as Moses looked, everyone say looked, looked, he looked, he looked over, he saw it. How many people know if a burning bush happened in front of you, it would catch your attention and you would look. And so he looked and he saw that the bush was on fire, but was not consumed. Then it goes on to say in verse three, so Moses thought, I got to go over and look at this remarkable sight. (laughs) And so it caught his attention. Why isn't the bush burning up? And in verse 4 it says, When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look. And so why am I telling you that? Because I believe in a personal meeting or an encounter with the presence of God. (coughs) That was like a cough about to happen and it came out kind of like, God. That was good. (laughs) I think there's a cooler spot on the stage over here. It's good. Look. So Moses looked. Why am I telling you that? Because in a personal meeting with God, we need to look first. We need to look. Well, why do we need to look? Because here's the deal. What are we looking at in worship? Are we looking at each other? Are we looking at our neighbor? 
Are we looking at what's happening next to us? Are we looking at who's into it and who's not into it? Are we looking for engagement level? Are we looking to make sure that the songs are connecting with the heart of the people? Are we looking at our watch to make sure that the song stops on time? Are we looking at our watch to make sure that it doesn't go too long and that we get comfortably out when we're supposed to? What are we looking at? Can I tell you, if you were looking at anything other than the glory of God, you were missing the point of worship. Because the first thing Moses did before he was consumed and in a conversation with God was that he looked in his direction. And here's the deal is I believe we have more glancing than we have looking going on in church. And what happens is there's a good show going on and we'll just glance over and keep moving in the direction that we want to. But there's something about intentionally looking in the direction of God. And in worship to have a personal meeting, we've got to look in that direction, not glance in it. Not just kind of like, oh, okay, let's just keep moving. How many people know that sometimes we just have, have a way of glancing at something and moving on with our life as if it were normal? God's not looking for ADHD worship on Sunday morning. He's not looking for that kind of worship that just glances, that just looks over and, and keeps moving. It's this, this intentional look that happened. Looking at God's glory, looking at His goodness, looking at the fullness of who He is. See, verse 4 tells us that Moses went over to look. It wasn't a glance, it was a look. And so here's something that can help you with how, how can we look, John? How can we make sure that we're fixated on God's glory and on His name? How can we make sure that we're in tune with God's presence? Here's a word, focus. Focus. It's a word that like kind of gets thrown around a lot because I'll be honest with you, and I'm not speaking this over me. I'm not coming into an agreement with something weird or anything. It's just the reality of uh, stuff that I deal with. Um, I, like ADHD is a real thing for me. I mean, like I took this test, and I think the scale is like 85 and above, you're normal, right? Like you don't have it. I think my, my numbers were, uh, <laughs> for the attention deficit part, it was, um, it was a zero. You can score a zero. It's a real thing. So I had a zero on that, and I had a 15 on the hyperactivity. <laughs> and so, like, like, that may be a diagnosis, or that may be something that, that I deal with. So, so how do I counteract ADHD? Well, it's really an intentional focus. I just told you God doesn't need ADD worship or ADHD worship. It, 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 it's a thought of focusing in on what's the most important thing. The breath of God has shown up. That's good. Do I got sweat spot showing? <laughs> like, <laughs> What's going on? And so, so we got to look. And, and, and the way we can look is that we focus, we concentrate in on, on what's the purpose of a Sunday morning? What's the purpose of when they start singing? What's the purpose of praise? What's the purpose of like when, when I get in the car and I got to reset and listen to some worship music? What's the purpose? It's to help our focus. See, 2 Corinthians 3.18, it tells us that we all with unveiled faces. So how do we have an unveiled face? It's through Christ. And so this is speaking to the believer with unveiled faces or looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord who is the Spirit. And so here's the deal to kind of give you application to that verse is it says as if we're looking in a mirror. And so you've got to look at what it means to look in a mirror. And a lot of times, some of us avoid them things. You know what I'm saying? Beach season here, summer, what? No, no mirror. Stay away. But if you look at, if you're looking in a mirror, you're looking with intent, right? Like there's a reason. I don't just, I don't just look in the mirror for no reason. Sometimes I avoid looking in the mirror because I don't want to, like, like I don't like what I see. I think spiritually we could talk about that too, but I don't want to camp there too long. But the thing about looking in a mirror is that mostly it's to fix something or it's looking with intent. And so... If we're looking with intent at the glory of God, we'll be changed by word and worship. And so we need to be intentional with our worship and what we're looking at. And so we've got look. The next thing that I saw was listen. Everyone say listen. So you got look and now you've got listen. In Exodus 3, 4, it says, When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called out to him from the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am. And so here's the deal. I find it interesting in verse 4 that it says, When the Lord saw Moses looked, then he spoke. Did y'all catch that? When he saw that he was looking, then he began to speak. And I tell you that maybe you're in a season in your life or in your worship or in this personal meeting that God is doing everything he can to get your attention. I find it interesting how much we want to hear God speak, but how little we spend time in his presence. And so he didn't even begin to speak until Moses looked in his direction. So I wonder how many times in, in our own search for 
deeper understanding of a relationship with God. We're getting to the listening part, but we haven't got the look down. And so maybe there's something in between there that could kind of help you in your growth and in your worship. Because God called, and He waited until He had His attention before He spoke. See, I believe that God's calling out to His children day in and day out. The loudest cry and call came from the cross when He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He was calling out to His kids that were so far from Him. And I believe that He's still calling and He's waiting to speak if we would just look in that direction. And so listen. Moses listened. See, we need to be in His presence if we want to hear Him speak. Because I would tell you this this morning is that I believe God is continuously speaking. And if you are in His presence, you can be around His voice that is continuously speaking. Well, how do I know that He's constantly talking? Well, Genesis, the creation, started with the spoken word. And God said, let there be light. Last I checked, there's still light. So this, this command of speaking started and it never stopped. And so maybe if you need to hear God, maybe it's look, focus, and then listen intently because He has your attention. See, in His presence, we can look. And then when He speaks, we need to be willing to listen intently. I think a lot of times we've glanced and maybe caught a glimpse or, 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 or heard just a whisper of God. But if we could truly get to a place where He has our undivided attention, then He could speak. And it's in His presence where all of this is made possible. And so if we need a personal meeting with God, see, the thing about what we just read in Exodus 3 is that, yeah, it was a personal meeting with God. There was a conversation happening that lasted over three chapters. And so in His presence, man, here's a few verses about His presence, and this is shifting gears a little bit. So why is it so important to be in His presence and to listen to Him speak? Well, Psalm 1611 tells us that you will make known to me the path of life and your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. And so maybe joy is something that's so far from you. Well, maybe it's the presence of God that's longing for you to, to, to just, just, just be there and consumed in because He's not after your happiness, He's after your joy. And so if, if happiness is determined by our surroundings, then joy is the fulfillment of what God does inside of us through His presence that the enemy can't touch, shake, or silence. And so it makes sense that in the presence of God there's fullness of joy. And it makes sense that in the fullness of joy we can give God the glory even if circumstances and situations don't look uh, so uplifting because He's the lifter of our head. It, and it's from the inside and so it's the fullness of joy. Psalm 68, 8, it says the earth quaked. The heavens also dropped rain at the presence of God. Sinai itself quaked at the presence of God, the God of Israel. And so what's that verse saying? That there are blessings in God's presence. And also, mountains can move in His presence. And so if you're dealing with some things that need to be moved, that need to quake and shake in the presence of God, maybe it's time to come in alignment with the presence of God to say, okay, it's in your presence that I can speak to these mountains and they can move. And, and this was a literal sense that happened, but there's a figurative sense that God can remove and move things and shift things and change things in you to draw you closer to Him so we can look and then we can listen. Mountains move in the presence of God. Here's what it says in Acts 3, verse 19. Therefore, repent and return. And so this isn't something haphazardly, casually, we can just kind of stroll into and expect a very personal and intimate encounter with God. This is something that happens when there's repentance. And I tell you that the greatest form to start a revival is to get around some repentant people that have cried out to God and said, I'm so, I'm so repentant. God, I've broken your heart and it bothers me. And I want to be drawn closer to you to see what would happen. And so Acts 3.19 says, Therefore repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come. I need some times of refreshing and I need them to come. Well, where does it come? From the presence of God, the God of Israel. And so maybe you're needing a refreshing touch of God. Well, it's in the presence of God that that's made uh, actually, uh, that, that's made whole. And so you've got look, you've got listen, and the last thing you've got is learn. I told you, man, 1048, we're flying. Third point, y'all are like, this guy is on it. Let's go. Look, listen, and learn. See, it's not just enough to look over. It's not just enough to listen. 
but it's to learn what God is saying in the moments that his presence is clear and that we're consumed by him. Because a lot of times we can look and we can be focused and we can begin to listen, but then there's something that happens when we don't want to learn what we're listening to. And so we may shift our attention in other directions. And so learn. Where do we see that? Exodus 3, 5. It says, do not come closer, he said. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And so it wasn't anything about the ground that was holy. It was everything about God that made the ground holy. Because God is holy. He is perfect. He is sovereign. He is good. He is great. And in His presence, there's fullness of joy. And so where's the lesson in that, John? Well, what Moses learned was anything that God touches becomes holy. That it had nothing to do with the surroundings. The bush wasn't holy. God was. The ground wasn't holy. God was. Moses wasn't holy, God was. And not only was it that he was, it's that he is. And so if we can recognize the holiness of God, then we can begin to learn some things. Here's, here's one thing Moses learned. Was it any place that God's presence manifests is a holy place. And the concept of taking off your sandals and your shoes and your feet, you know, we talked about that and the reason for that in Eastern culture was it was a recognition of the uncleanliness that showed up in the presence of God, and so it was removing shoes and in reverence. You know, what does reverence look like? I just told you it's a personal meeting, man, so for some it's the acknowledgement of the presence of God and how heavy it is by bowing down in His presence. For others, it's lifting surrendered hands and saying, God, you're holy. For others, it's standing in silence and in reverence. For some, it's getting the Word of God and having Scripture just going through as music or worship is being offered. So there's a lot to learn, man. Did you know that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible? If you knew that or not. But he's accredited to write the first five books of the Bible. And so I found myself asking... How could Moses How could Moses write the first five books of the Bible? Because if in Genesis creation happened in the conversation we read in Exodus, there's a maybe a thousand years, 2,500 years, some scholars would, would agree on chronologicalizing the story. Well, how did Moses write things? Well, Moses only wrote what he learned. Well, how did he learn what was in the presence of God? Well, what was he doing in the presence of God? He was listening. And he was recording the things that God spoke and the things that God did. I mean, the only way that he could have written the first five books is God teaching him. He spent time in the presence of God. Psalms 103.7. And I think I put this in your notes. If I didn't, this is one that you'll want to jot down. Psalms 103.7. It says that he made known his ways to Moses and his acts to the sons of Israel. Let me say it a different way. See, what he did was seen through the children of Israel. Why he did it was seen in the writings that Moses produced. And so what this tells us is that there are things that God wants us to learn and that can only be learned in his presence when he's speaking and when we're listening. And it's got to start with a look, not a glance, but it's got to be something so intentionally focused, just like when we're talking to our kids, hey, look at me, son, I'm about to tell you something. I wonder how many times God is saying at the beginning of a, of a worship service or, or maybe even your personal private devotion at home, and he's like, son, daughter, I need you to look. Okay, I need you to look because I'm about to download heaven on you. I'm about to download it on you. Because God didn't go silent after the words were recorded. He still speaks. Now here's the deal about God still speaking. Is that He won't speak anything out of what's already been revealed in Scripture. And so there's a balance to that. There are some people that claim God said this new revelation and this is what we're to do. But it's absolute heresy that has nothing to do with the Word of God. And so if God is speaking, it will come in alignment with His Word. Because we worship God in spirit and in truth. And so I want to get that out there because there are some false teachers... And it's breaking my heart that the church is accepting these people 
to speak and put God's name on something that has nothing to do with Him. And all I want to see is people set free by the presence of God, not by giving me $54 million. It breaks my heart that people would fall into something when people say, then God said. Can I tell you something that's pretty interesting too? Well, yeah, Moses was special. That's why he heard from God. God invited all the children of Israel up to the mountain and they said, no, Moses, you go and we'll listen to what he says through you. Unfortunately, that's happening in the church today. That God wants to speak to you individually in a personal meeting, but it's like, nah, just send the pastor. Whatever he says is good. Whatever he says is gold. And I tell you that everything that I say has to come in a alignment with the scriptures it has to come in alignment with the authority of God because if it's not his not his word it's my word and according to his word I'm going to stand judgment for everything that I do potentially to mislead his children and I don't want to mislead anyone here's what I want you to do is experience the fullness of joy in the presence of God and the way to get you there is to look to listen and to learn because that's who he is he's a God who wants to teach his kids And he'll send teachers to help. And he'll send preachers to help. But it doesn't negate the responsibility for you to study diligently the Word of God. To find your own worship. Yeah, there's worship that can break the bondage off of your neighbor. But at some point, it will be you and God and God alone. And I can't worship on your behalf in heaven. For you. And it's the reality of worship. That it's more than just singing, it's a personal meeting. Exodus 33, 7 through 11. This is now Moses took a tent and pitched it outside the camp at a distance from the camp. He called it the tent of meeting. Anyone who wanted to consult the Lord would go to the tent of meeting that was outside the camp. And so whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would stand up, each one at the door of his tent, and they would watch Moses until he entered the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of the cloud would come down and remain at the entrance of the tent. And then the Lord would speak with Moses. As all the people saw the pillar of cloud remaining at the entrance to the tent, they would stand up and bow and worship, each one of them at the door of his tent. Then the Lord would speak with Moses face to face just as a man speaks with his friend. Then Moses would return to the camp. His assistant, the young man Joshua, son of Nun, would not leave the inside of the tent. So why do I read all of that? Because a lot of stuff happens there. The last verse we just read has got a whole lot of nuggets in it. Joshua didn't leave the inside of the tent. Why? Because I maybe think that he would know that even if there's just an ounce of that cloud left, that he could be swept up in the presence of God just as Moses was. And so what's significant about Moses speaking with God is it says that he spoke to him as a friend. Well, why is that important? Because it tells us that Jesus says, no longer do I call you servants. From now on, I call you friends for servants don't know what their master is going to do. And so God is looking for us to look at him, to listen to him, to learn from him because he wants to speak to us, not as a master speaking to slaves, but as a friend, as a father speaking to a son, as a father speaking to a daughter, to grow intimately in a personal meeting. And so here's your big takeaway today. Our perspective changes in the presence of God. And I believe this morning we need some perspective to change because our perspective has been completely consumed by our surroundings, by our circumstances, by the temperature of this room, by how long this service is going when we're trying to wrap it up early, whatever is around us, maybe it's a perspective shift to say, okay, God, I've glanced in your direction, but you've got my attention. It took me coming to a service in South Alabama when it's a hundred something degrees in this room, and I'm looking at you because I need to hear from you. I need to hear from you on behalf of my family. I need to hear from you on behalf of my job. I need to hear from you on behalf of my parenting and my kids and my circumstances and my surroundings and my witness and my worship. I need to hear from you today, God. I've heard from a lot of people, but I need to hear from you because in your presence is fullness of joy. In your presence, mountains move. In your presence, blessings come. And so, God, we need your presence. We don't need perfect circumstances. We need the presence of a perfect God. And so I wonder what would happen if our our shift... Yeah, I caught myself. We good? We good? I was about to be on YouTube, y'all. Still probably going to make it. Our perspective has to change. I'm going to read 
a lot of scripture that's not in your notes, but I really want you to hear this. Psalm 73, I'm going to read 17 scripture. Our perspective changes in the presence of God. David says, God is indeed good to Israel, to the pure in heart. But as for me, my feet almost slipped. My steps nearly went astray, for I envied the arrogant. I saw the prosperity of the wicked. He's saying that he's seen others prosper while he who is submitted and committed to God is struggling with things. They have an easy time until they die and their bodies are well fed. They are not in trouble like others. They are not afflicted like most people. Therefore, pride is their necklace and violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge out of, from fatness. The imaginations of their hearts run wild. They mock and they speak maliciously. They arrogantly threaten oppression. They set their mouths against heaven and their tongues strut across the earth. Therefore his people turn to them and drink in their overflowing words. And so David's like, man, what's going on? People are turning towards this. People are listening to this. And like, here I am trying to uphold the word of God. What's going on? The wicked say, how can God know? Does the most high know everything? Verse 12, look at them. The wicked, they're always at ease. And they increase their wealth. Did I purify my heart and wash my hands in innocence for nothing? For I am afflicted all day long and punished every morning. If I had decided to say these things aloud, I would have betrayed your people. And so he's having this moment with himself. It's a pity party that no one else is at. And David is at the end of himself saying, man, what, what is this all about? In verse 16, when I tried to understand all of this, it seemed hopeless. Are you there, friend? Does everything seem hopeless? Can you connect to the heart of David? Maybe it's not the heart that says, I'll bless the Lord at all times. Maybe it's the heart that says, yo, for 16 verses, David gave us insight to what he was really feeling. How did his perspective change? Well, this is the beauty of Scripture. Verse 17, it says, until I entered God's sanctuary, until I was in the presence of God, then I begin to learn and he talks about judgment for the wicked and he changes and shifts his perspective. See, when our perspective is off, we need to get in the presence of God. I wonder how many times we've allowed an off perspective keep us in a season longer than we were ever intended to be in it. Because we glanced at everything God was doing, but we never looked, we never focused, we never listened, we never learned. David had to come to that point. And where did he come to that point? Until I was in the presence of God. So I felt this way until I was in the presence of God. I feel this way about my kids right now. I need to get in the presence of God. I feel this way about my spouse right now. I need to get in the presence of God. I feel this way about my circumstances, my job. I didn't get the uh, promotion. I'm not in the job that I wanted. I'm not in the calling that I wanted. Well, then get in the presence of God. Because it's in the presence of God that he begins to download heaven into your life. And so our perspective changes in the presence of God. So maybe we need our perspective to shift. When we look, when we listen, when we learn, when we're drawn closer to God, in his presence he speaks. In his presence there's fullness of joy. Bow your heads with me this morning. So maybe you're there. Maybe you're saved. And maybe you've recognized Jesus as your Savior. But you're in here today and you're like, yo, I'm a whole lot closer to David's frustrations than I am to David's freedom. And, and, and now that you've pointed out that even for David, things didn't shift until he got into the presence of God. John, that's where I need to be because I don't have joy. I don't have fulfillment. I'm frustrated with life. I'm frustrated with marriage. I'm frustrated with my kids. And I need the presence of God to shift everything in my life. If that's you, would you slip your hand up and slip it down? I'm not going to embarrass you. Thank you so much. God, you see that there needs to be a shift in the atmosphere of perspective. God, that you're drawing your sons and your daughters closer to you. God, that it's in your presence is fullness of joy. And so, God, we want your presence wherever we go. God, as Moses said in the wilderness, God, if your presence isn't forward, then I don't even want to be there because I want to be in your presence. If your presence isn't in comfort, but it's in conviction, I want to be in your presence. So maybe you're here this morning and, and all of this is new. Maybe this is your place of saying, you know what? I've never come to the saving knowledge of Christ. I've never recognized my need of a Savior, and I want to do so this morning. And I tell you that what will meet you is not guilt and condemnation. It is grace and freedom and salvation in the person of Jesus Christ. And so maybe you're here this morning, and this is your moment for salvation. 
I'm not going to ask you to repeat a prayer after me or come up here and stand in front of everyone. I'm just asking you to acknowledge Him. And if you do so, you know, it says in the, in the Word of God, the only reason we even ask you to raise your hand is in the Word of God, it says that a celebration breaks out over your life. We want to celebrate here on earth with you. Is that you this morning? Do you need to come to the saving knowledge of Christ? Would you slip your hand up and slip it down? Thank you. From the response, I would say that we're all good. And so the perspective that needs to shift and change, it happens in His presence. Would you stand with me? We're going to close the service out in six and a half minutes. Jared, would you lead us in a course? the needing to shift perspective would you just press into worship right now little listen and learn that in your presence we would look that we would listen and we would learn and if our perspective gets off I pray that it's the presence of God we run to Father we love you and we pray that as we go our separate ways that you give us even more opportunities to participate in moments of your grace Father we love you, we thank you and it's in your name, amen and amen. Youth camp meeting with Carl in the back uh, hey guys I'm sorry I got one more thing I want to say we have a group of students going to kids camp and they have left already. I think they've left like in the last 30 minutes or so. Um, at some point in your own prayer time, can you just pray over these kids that they would have an encounter with the real true living God and come back ready to encourage you in your faith and your walk. Be blessed. Go participate in grace.